on her vacation. Wherever she is, she attends church, even if it's a little country church up in the Northland. And she has her own little side exit or an entrance that she comes in, sits down quietly in her place. People don't bother her. They recognize that she needs her privacy too. And then she slips out at the end of the service and uh, goes back to her castle, I guess it is. So uh, Elizabeth II, Queen Elizabeth II. Now, the heir to the throne now is Prince who? Prince Charles, that's right, Prince Charles. He's 71 years old. And so he's the uh, coming heir. And let's hope and pray that Prince Charles follows his mother's devotion and principles uh, in his own personal life as well. What do you say? We can be praying for leaders of the nations of this world, right? This sermon series is entitled Battles of the Heart. And there's plenty of battles in Second Chronicles. This country going into war against that country and lots of people dying. And war is a terrible thing. But there's an even more important battle that's being fought in the book of Second Chronicles and in the hearts of the king of Second Chronicles. And that's the, and in our hearts too. That's why we're talking about it here 3,000 years later. That battle is the battle of who is going to reign as the king in our lives, in our hearts. Now King Asa and his wife that we talked about last week, and someone told me just today, said, I've never heard a sermon in my life about King Asa. Well, I guess I hadn't either. Uh, he's a, he was a very good king. He made some mistakes at the very end of his life. He was not perfect, but for most of his life, he led the people of Judah, the nation of Judah, to the worship of the true God. King Asa and his wife, she's actually named in the Bible, must have done a good job raising their son. Their son's name was Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means God judges, or God will judge. And yes, he does. There is a judgment day. And judgment comes in small points, small amounts, until that great judgment day as well. God honors those who honor him. Amen? Amen. That's what the Bible says. He that honors me, I will honor. God he doesn't just pick favorites. He's not just being arbitrary. But that's he, as he wants to bless your life, you have to be open to the blessings that he has for you. And so if you're going a different direction than God, then he can't pour the blessings into your life that he wants to. But as we dedicate our lives to him, he has blessings for you that would not come otherwise. So Jehoshaphat had these good godly influences as he was growing up. He saw his dad lead the people back to God. He saw his dad's mistakes, too. How many of you could name at least one mistake or fault of your parents? Let me see your hands. <laughs> okay. You know, teenagers have a special talent for this. And uh, so uh, I know that I'm not perfect either, and uh, I'm trying to be as uh, good a parent as I know, and I'm still growing in that, just ask my kids. Okay, so God is good. He gave Jehoshaphat the uh, privilege of being, getting a, a mentoring start to his kingdom. Uh, scholars think that he probably was co-regent or co-king with his father in the last two or three years of Asa's life, when the Bible says that King Asa was uh, crippled by a severe foot condition that caused him extreme pain and he couldn't get rid of it. And it seemed to be something that God allowed because of the, the poor choices that, Jehosh that uh, Jehoshaphat's father, Asa, had made. In, eight, in 871 BC, Jehoshaphat, uh, at age 35, became the king, the king of the nation of Judah. The nation of Israel under David, Solomon, had now split into two. There was the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and the northern kingdom of Israel went way off the tracks. Have you ever heard of the names Ahab and Jezebel? They were contemporaries with Jehoshaphat. 
they were absolutely intent on demonic deception and idol worship and all kinds of sexual perversions in the northern country of Israel. And so that evil influence was affecting the southern country of Judah. And Asa and Jehoshaphat were used by God to, to stem the tide of apostasy. So now as the leader of the nation of Judah, Jehoshaphat takes immediate action. He's already made his decision to follow God. He made that decision before he became king. Praise God. And so God is preparing him, and he's preparing you. God has something important for you to do in the future, but it depends on your choosing God now so he can develop in you the character and the wisdom that you will need for that more difficult time that's coming in your future. Turn in your Bible to, or your electronic device, to 2 Chronicles 17, verses 3 and 4. 2 Chronicles, where is that? Uh, there it says, uh, right there before Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, we don't talk too much about 2 Chronicles, but the Jewish people, they know 2 Chronicles. They actually have Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, as one book. But they know Chronicles very well because it's the last book in the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. In the Jewish Bible, Chronicles is the very last. It was one of the last books of the Bible written. Malachi was probably written afterward, but right near that, just before that time, the book of Chronicles was written. We don't know who put it all together. Uh, very possibly, Ezra had part in play in that. Uh, but there were other uh, later editions after that as well. And 2 Chronicles 17, verses 3 and 4, says this. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the former ways of his father, who? David. And he did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not according to the acts of Israel. Israel. Northern Israel. In other words, he did not walk according to to the apostasy and the degradation of Ahab and Jezebel just over the border to the north. And so, here we see that all of the king's string of successes were due to his following God and to God's blessings on him and leading him. They were the result of one young man's choice to follow God, the true God of heaven. What choice are we making today? Each of us are making a choice. Each of us choose each day whom we will serve. The Bible says, choose you this day, today, every day, whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. What do you say? Amen. Uh, notice the word therefore in verse 5. Verse 5 says, therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hands, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat, and he had riches and honor in abundance. So that word, what does that word therefore mean? There's lots of therefores in the Bible. What does the word therefore mean? What is that, what did the author throw that in there for? It means that what happened before effected and brought about what happened afterwards. Therefore. There's a cause and effect relationship there. So therefore, because he walked in the commandments of the Lord, that's all ten commandments. That's all twelve commandments. The ten commandments... You can read them there in Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy, first part of Deuteronomy as well. And then Jesus emphasized that the summary of those ten commandments was in two great commandments. Love God with all your heart and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love other people. Serve other people. And those are the parts of the commandments that Jehoshaphat was obeying as he walked in the commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. <coughs> the true story of King Jehoshaphat contains two great secrets for a successful Christian life. Now, if I ask you at the end of the message today what those two great <coughs> secrets are, I think you'll be able to tell me. But those two great secrets for a successful Christian life that are illustrated in the life of Jehoshaphat are faithfully prepare and 
courageously be the light. We're going to talk about that more. So Jehoshaphat had to make a choice. Would it be to serve Baal, or sometimes pronounced Baal? Or would it be to serve the true God, the creator God, the God of heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of David, the God of Asa, his father? He had to make a choice. Would it be Baal and the Asherah images and their sensual fertility rites and their feasts on the, on the high places and all the good food and all, all the attractions? Or would it be the true God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the true creator God of heaven and earth? Now, Baal is short for Baal Hadad. Baal Hadad was the chief god, the head god, the king god of the entire Canaanite pagan uh, pantheon. There were lots of gods. But Baal Hadad was the top god. He was over all of them. He was the god of war. He can give them victory in war. He was the god of thunder, and his name literally means master of thunder. Master of thunder. So he was the one that could bring the rain, the rain would bring the crops, the crops would bring life, and so he was the god, the source of life. Or so they were being told. So those lies were all centered around Baal, Hadad, shortened to Baal. He's pictured, we, we have actual carvings of this god, what they thought he looked like, he had a beard, he wore a headdress, Sometimes his headdress had horns sticking out of it. He held a lightning bolt in one hand. He held a club in another. He was the god of rain, thunder, and war. And uh, mixed in with that was <coughs> Asherah, his consort, uh, goddess of fertility, mother goddess of all the gods. And so there we have uh, the competition, the lies that Satan brought into the very heart of his chosen people at this time. And at that very time, Jehoshaphat, now while he was king in Judah, the northern country was just going under in terrible demonic apostasy. King, evil King Ahab, his pagan wife Jezebel, were successfully promoting Baal worship and the worship of Ashtoreth as the national religion of Israel. Can you imagine such a thing? God help us all to not make choices for even smaller idols that may be distracting us. Jehoshaphat made his choice, the creator of heaven and earth, Yahweh, the God of grace and deliverance. Second Chronicles 17.3 says this, Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the former ways of his father David, and he did not seek the Baals. So this was the young king's preparation for the task of being the king of the country of Judah. The tur what turned out to be one of Judah's most successful reigns was undergirded by a personal choice of one young man to serve the true God and to follow his commandments. You know, there are a lot of people today that are saying, well, I'm a Christian, but I just don't believe in keeping God's commandments. What? You believe in God, but you are not willing to do what God has asked you to do? Friends, we maybe all today need to think, am I being faithful to the covenant that God has placed before me in His grace? So, verse 4 says, he sought the God of his father, that's Asa. He was actively seeking a personal, committed relationship with God. He was seeking. That's so significant. Last week we saw the same words. Asa was seeking God. He sought God. He wasn't just going through the motions. He was seeking a personal, committed relationship with God. I want to seek more every day a personal close relationship with God, don't you? Amen. What did this choosing God mean to Jehoshaphat? What, what, what did that look like on the ground? What was that all about? 
choosing God. Well, in verse 4, it says he sought the God of his fathers. That means a choice and the active personal relationship with God. Verse 4, as he walked in, his, in God's commandments, not according to the acts of Israel, the wicked acts of Ahab and Jezebel. You know, it's one thing to say, I love God. It's a very different choice to say, I love God enough to live in his will, to follow his commandments. Because, not because I have to, but because I love him. And I know that whatever he asks of me is because he loves me and he wants benefits, me to enjoy the benefits of heaven. So Jehoshaphat knew God and he knew and did God's will. And so his life and kingdom flourished, the Bible says. And this was the preparation, the, the uh, spiritual and the character preparation that Jehoshaphat made. And made, God was leading him be prepared for the more difficult days ahead. Now next week, as we talk about, uh, two weeks from today, as we talk about the next phase of Jehoshaphat's life, we'll find that Jehoshaphat made some mistakes that he was later sorry for, and that God forgave him. But right now, God's trying to prepare him to avoid those very mistakes. So, are we just Christians, or are we literally seeking a deeper daily walk with Jesus Christ? That's what the God's offering us so much. He's offering us a deeper walk as we prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming back to this earth. He's coming back in person. The Bible says every eye will see him. I believe that day is not far off. Amen. This world is changing fast, and you know it. We're seeing things we've never seen before. Not only is there a virus that's going around the world, and in the United States now it's already killed over 150,000 people, but now there's chaos in the streets. Police are being attacked. Um, Police who are protecting people, citizens. Uh, we're living in an unusual and strange time. We might just pause and say, for the few police officers that have gone be outside of their, their policies and in prejudice or in experience or hatred or whatever it is, have treated people unfairly or unnecessarily brutally, that's wrong. But we thank God for the activity of the great majority of our peace officers. Amen. And the Bible even says, Paul gives some kind of hard words there, but he says, Paul says, the one who bears the sword, the policeman of his day, the soldier, is God's servant to uh, administer God's justice. That's what he, the Bible says. And so that's, that's, the, that's what Christians believe about law enforcement. It should be done fairly, justly, but it is certainly a tool that is to all of our benefit to keep the peace. Do we just know the 12 commandments? Or are we seeking to live by the spirit of the commandments? Like Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not asking how little we can do, or how we can barely get by, but asking God, what more can I do to serve you? Because your grace and salvation as a free gift have been so great in my life. Uh, for example, are we asking ourselves, how am I treating my parents or other family members, even when they're kind of frustrating to me? You know, not only do young people ask that question, uh, but, uh, you know, as our parents age, sometimes they become difficult to know exactly how best to help them in their declining years. How? 
Are we treating our parents and family members even when they frustrate us? Are we taking time to plan uh, now to make each Sabbath a delight, as the Bible says? To make each Sabbath a also, it's all 24 hours, a holy time with God. How are our Sabbath afternoons increasing our faith and our walk with God? Jesus was thinking of our benefit when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, you can be you, you and I. We can be faithful now. We can be faithful now, preparing for the future, just like Joshua did. What do you say? Now, notice that this young king went beyond his spiritual preparation. He didn't just stop at preparing his heart and pr with prayer and study of the scriptures, he went into very practical aspects too. And so we see that in the first two verses of chapter 17. Second Chronicles 17, 1 says, Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. Oh, he strengthened himself against the attack, the possible attack of the northern kingdom of Israel. Verse 2, And he placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. In other words, northern Israel had not attacked during his reign, but he could see that they were trying, they were building up their strength along the border to attack. And so he strengthened his troops. He fortified his cities. He made preparations that in case they needed to defend the families of Judah, they would have a trained army on the border and in the cities ready to defend. Does that make sense? Yes. So his preparation was not just spiritual preparation, it was actual physical preparation as well. Are we making preparations for the future here in just practical ways? I'm going to ask this as a question to young people here. I define young people as anyone under 45 years old. No. Okay, I know that's a little stretch. Okay. Uh, let's go with 35 years old. I'll uh, we'll stretch it to 39 years old. Uh, so, our young people, are you planning for the future by getting an education, a training, so that you can have a career, so that you can support yourself, and maybe someday a family, and God's work with the funds that you earn by hard work? Are you making that preparation? Uh, all of us, are we living a healthy lifestyle? That's one of the most important preparations that we can make for the future. Are you living by the big four? What are the big four? The big four is lifetime exercise, preferably daily, in the fresh air, and a plant-based, whole food diet, and third, total abstinence from mind-altering, recreational drugs and alcohol, and fourth, adequate rest through faith and sleep and Sabbath. The word Sabbath means rest, right? So all those go together in us getting rest. Those four things are the big four for health, which is a great way to prepare for the future. Now we, in this congregation, we have a lot of 90-year-olds. Why? Why are there so many 90-year-olds in this congregation? Because a lot of them have been practicing the big four most of their lives. Amen. It's not an accident. Well, some of, the, some of it is, is they got some good genes. But most of our health in the future is based on the lifestyle we live. Uh, we even had a member of our congregation turn 101 years old this year. Praise God for that wonderful energy and longevity. Here's a question for you. Are we planning for financial independence through getting out of debt completely, working a monthly budget, uh, also saving for the future, and being faithful with Christ's tithes and offerings? Are we planning for the future, making preparation? And as with Jehoshaphat, preparation always pays off. Amen? Amen.
So, you want to be used by God uh, in your Christian life, right? So the second secret is courageously be the light. Second Chronicles. Turn in your Bible. Second Chronicles 17, verse 6. In ESV it says, and his, it says, and his heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. I like that. His heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. NIV says his heart was devoted. In New King James says his heart was took delight in the ways of the Lord. All those are true. But you know, it wasn't always easy. Jehoshaphat faced difficult times, and so that's why it took courage. His heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. Courage to break down and cut down pagan worship sites. Courage to be a light in a dark world. That was Jehoshaphat. Jesus said in John 8, verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Jesus being the light of the world. But the, what he said next in Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16, now that comes as a little bit of a shock. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Now, we would have never come up with that text if we were trying to think of some, writing some part of the Bible. We would have never thought, I am the light of the world. No. But Jesus said, you, each one of you, as you give your life to God, filled with the Holy Spirit, receiving the light from God, the truth of God, the, the character of God, the love of God, to share with others, you become the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Him. Your Father, which is in heaven. You know, there are thousands of specific ways that we can be the light, that we can take action to glorify God. When you take action that glorifies God, you are being the light. Jehoshaphat did two things. He confronted the mis misinformation. He confronted Satan's lies. He spoke out. He said, tear down this altar. He said, cut down this Asherah pole. And they did. And he said, quit lying to my people. He spoke out. And today God give us, may God give each of us the courage to speak truth and reality into our families, our neighborhoods, our society. And the Bible says we should always speak the truth in what? In love. <coughs> speak the truth in love. But speak the truth. Don't hibernate. Don't power. Don't go and hide in a cave like Elijah, thinking, oh, poor me, I'm the only one left. No, speak out. Share truth. Think, ask for divine opportunities each day to share some item of truth and love and reality with others. Uh, verses 7 through 9. Not only was Jehoshaphat not just, he was not just tearing down, he was also building up. Here's what it says in verses 7 through 9. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent his leaders, Ben Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, Micah, Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites. Okay, we're going to skip a few of those long, hard names, okay? <coughs> and at the end of that verse, uh, 8 says, and with them Elishama and Jehoram the priests. Verse 9, so they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them, and they went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Wow. That is unusual. That is unusual. Uh, have we ever heard, have you ever heard of a king instigating a traveling Bible <coughs> seminar? I don't think that's all that common, do you? It's not, certainly not common in the world today, and it wasn't, that com it wasn't common back then in Jehoshaphat's time as well. So in the third year as king, which the scholars say probably was his first year as king solo, king by himself after his dad died because of his co-regency with his sick father for a few years before that, Jehoshaphat launched an innovative and visionary evangelistic campaign 
throughout all the cities of Judah. Now that would take quite a while. There are many cities in Judah. And there are many other, other smaller towns and villages as well. And so at the king's bidding, this 16 person, he named 16 people, this 16 person evangelistic team hits the road. And with them, they take the sacred scroll. The sacred scroll, scroll of Moses from the temple. And they take it as the learning textbook for the, for the people of Judah. And so you can just picture it in your mind. The messengers, the couriers are sent out all through Judah, the nation of Judah. And they're sent out with a message. And the message is, the king's Bible seminar is coming to your town. Everybody get ready to welcome them. The king is sending the, his princes and his priests. And they're going to come with the law of God in their hand. And they're going to teach you. So be ready when they, they come. This is not just for the city council. This is not just for the chief magistrates. This is for everybody. All men, women, and children will be invited to gather together in the plaza to hear the word of God read. So be ready to gather everyone together to learn the law of the Lord. And the couriers race off on horseback to the next town, and the next town, and the next city. Get people ready for the traveling Bible seminar. People get excited. People are excited to learn that a team of national, top national leaders are coming to their city. I remember when I was a boy, I was in uh, fourth grade. My sister was in third grade. That, uh, President John F. Kennedy was doing a tour of the Northwest. He toured Hanford. Thousands of people came out to see him there from the Tri-Cities and Yakima area. And uh, my dad worked for the city county health department. And somehow through his department, he got tickets to go to this appearance at Cheney Stadium. And so he took my sister and myself to see the President of the United States. Well, that made a huge impression on a young boy. I was We were the only ones from our church school that got to go. And so that kind of made us the little heroes when we came back the next day and told them we'd seen the President of the United States. And uh, so we thought that was pretty good too. But I remember that so well. The excitement in the air. A few hundred people, it wasn't a large crowd, a few hundred people waiting in Cheney Stadium. The sharpshooters on the light towers with their automatic weapons ready to protect the President of the United States. And then, and the uh, helicopter comes in. And everyone decides the President's here. The helicopter lands in the parking lot, a cloud of dust, and nothing happens. We wait, 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 nothing happens. Where's the President? Then, over the hill comes another big army helicopter. Okay, the president's here. Nope, wasn't him. Where's the president? Then, pretty soon, five minutes later, and here comes the third helicopter. It lands, and in just a few minutes, a whole bunch of dignitaries walk in, and in the middle of them, the Secret Service agent, is the president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. I remember him speaking. We have a whole movie of him, his uh, speech there. And it's, it's exciting to see of the leader of this greatest nation on earth. So the people there were excited. Their, their top national officials were going to come to their town. The best Bible teachers, even the high priest himself, comes and teaches the people. The crowds gather. The mayor ceremoniously welcomes all the honored guests to their city. And uh, then the royal officials, maybe princes, maybe these were the sons of Jehoshaphat that he sent out. The King James Version says they were princes. Uh, New King James Version says they were officials. Anyway, they were high up in the government, official representatives of the king. And uh, the royal officials step forward and explain the importance of the law of God for all of God's people. And then the crowd hushes as the high priest reverently holds high priest steps forward very carefully takes off the covering assisted by the Levites <coughs> and he holds up before the people the law 
of Yahweh, the law of the Lord their God, given by God himself to Moses, and Moses wrote it down as a true prophet of God, and they taught from this scroll. We don't know exactly how much they read. They may have stood there for hours. They may have read the entire Pentateuch, which is called the Torah, the law, the first five books of the Bible. This replica is all in Hebrew, as the Bible was originally written in, in the Old Testament. The people are standing there very quietly. They realize the significance of the day that they're hearing these words read. And God spoke all these words. The high priest may have said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. The third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. On the media today, we're hearing a lot of taking God's name in vain, are we? What was improper on the airwaves just a few years ago now is commonplace as God's name is dragged in the dust and used as a curse word and swear word right here on in America. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day, Saturday, is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gate. Wow! God gave even the slaves, even the servants, one whole day off, 24 hours, every single week. It was unheard of in ancient times. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Ten, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor his car, nor his riding lawnmower, nor his, nor his boat, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The high priest may have gone to these eternal words in Deuteronomy, the last book of the Pentateuch. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, as he stood before the people of this particular walled city of Judah at the behest of the king, young King Jehoshaphat. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord Yahweh, is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And with these words I command you today to be, that they shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Friends, we have a responsibility in our homes to teach our children and our grandchildren the way of God. Amen? Amen. Young people are going to make their own choice, but they deserve to know the truth and to know it in some detail and to know why it matters to you and why it matters to them. That's why we have Sabbath school for the children, not just for adults. That's why we have our Seventh-day Adventist Christian school. It's not just for mathematics and social studies and language skills, though it does an excellent job with those. But it's also to shape a character for life and for eternity. Share them with your children. Share them with your children. Teach the children. And after the priests read a section from the scroll, 
the priest would reverently lay down the scroll and there would be a brief teaching intermission. And the Levites would fan out through the crowd and speak to smaller groups and explain and take questions and answer questions and explain the reading that had just been given. What happened next? The book of Prophets and Kings says this. Prophets and Kings says, and as many endeavor to understand God's requirements and to put away sin, a revival was effected. Many endeavored to understand God's requirements and commandments and chose to sin. And as a result, revival was brought to the nation of Judah. Person by person, city by city, village by village, it made a difference in the history of Israel and the nation of Judah. So you too can experience revival in your life, can't you? Can, can we experience revival in our lives in, in the year 2020? Yes, we can. We can experience new victories. We can experience uh, faith and joy in our lives. And sometimes we just need to get back to the Word of God get back to prayer, get back to the promises of God and believe His promises and claim His promises because if you ask for the Holy Spirit the Bible says He will give you the Holy Spirit and you'll be filled with the growing knowledge and faith and joy of God. He'll give you new insights as you study His Word. Each morning as you open the Bible He'll lead you to promises that you can claim for that day He'll give you insights in how you can put the Word of God into action in your life. And as you claim God's supernatural promises, He will faithfully keep His Word. Amen? Amen. As an evangelistically centered church here, we must never stop reaching out to others for whom Christ died on the cross. We can never selfishly keep it all to ourselves. We must continue to be an individual make, individually make this an evangelism-centered church. With, by giving personal Bible studies to friends, by, with our health seminars, with, our, uh, with other outreaches like Journey to Bethlehem, with our public evangelistic Bible teaching seminars and prophecy seminars, we must prioritize our children and our grandchildren, and make sure that they have the opportunity for a high-quality Adventist Christian education, all the way from grade school all the way through college. We didn't come up with this idea of Adventist Christian education. God gave it to His church in visions, and it's based on Bible principles that say we must teach our children every day and we must train them in the way of God. You know, our church is committed to making Adventist Christian education at our local school, grades pre-K through 10, a financial possibility for every single member family. Praise God. I could think I could hear a few more amens on that. Amen. This church is sacrificing to make possible funds that make it possible for every single family to place their children in an Adventist Christian school. Amen. And uh, that school is doing such a high quality job. And you can see it in the evidence of those who graduate four years later, six years later, eight, eight years later, ten years later, and see what our school set the foundation for. Those who are out there doing an excellent job maintaining diesel engines. Those who are graduating from medical school and dental school. Those who are entering the teaching profession to raise up a new generation of God-fearing young people. All those coming out of the, the, the small, the small, and medium-sized Seventh-day Adventist 
Cool. You know, <clears throat> water is such a good invention, isn't it? Yes. I love it. Amen. It's great. Thank you, God. Amen. That's really good. So like Jehoshaphat, you can faithfully prepare. That's what he did. And you can faithfully prepare for the future. And you can courageously be the light. And share truth. But will you ask God to give you the courage to do that? That's the question for today. Will you ask God to give you the courage to make the preparations necessary for the future and then to be the light, to debunk the lies, and to share the truth and the love of God? So what was the result of King Jehoshaphat's leadership and Judah's turning to God? Well, look at verses 10, 12 to 13, Second Chronicles, chapter 17, verse 10. And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land that were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Wow. They did not attack Jehoshaphat. For years and years, there was total peace for Jehoshaphat. Now, here's something that's very interesting. Uh, talking about preparation. This king was really prepared. And he gives us some actual facts and numbers here in verses 12 through 13. So Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful. God was building up his kingdom. And he built fortresses and storage cities in Judah, just in case. He had much property or supplies in the storage cities of Judah. And the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in Jerusalem. So there's this huge encampment of so trained soldiers in and around Jerusalem. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, a few guards, you know, on the city walls. I was shocked at the numbers. Uh, we're not going to go through all the details here, but you can read those in the following verses. In verse 14, 15, 16, 17, it tells of these five different uh, 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 contingents, these five different groups of soldiers these five battalions, and they're huge. The total number, I pulled out my adding machine, was one mil million soldiers. Over one million soldiers are stationed around Jerusalem, and plus others that are out in the surrounding walled cities, in the fortress cities, just in case. Jehoshaphat believed in being prepared. But here's what's interesting. One million soldiers without a job. One million soldiers with nothing to do. Why? Because God had given the nation peace. Praise God. That's, that's the story. That's the result of their faithful following of God. You know, of peace. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is our peace. In Ephesians 2, verse 14. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I will say, rejoice. Let's rejoice today, amen? Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Jesus is coming soon, right? Amen. And verse 7, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, the peace of a relationship with God, the peace of eternal security, knowing that you have been given the free gift of eternal life by His grace. Not because you're so good, but because you have dedicated your life to follow Him. giving us this chance today to again acknowledge 
our love for you, our willingness to follow wherever you lead, our willingness to keep all of your commandments and to be the light and share that light with others. Lord, give us the courage to confront the lies and to share the love and truth of God with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, and may the law of the Lord be our light and our strength this week.